up in my teens in the 60s, left school in 69. I, I can remember things like the Imps and the Minis and the, the 1100s, the early MGs, um, Rileys, Triumphs, and I'd always like that, that sort of mechanical approach to, to, to cars. Simple, if it broke down, you could fix it by the side of the road. I, I mean, when I left school, I went into a, um, a garage as an apprentice mechanic, um, and it was a uh, Roots and Standard Triumph. And I, I, I just love that era of cars. I come across this picture of this sort of rather sort of grubby looking two-seater sports coupe sat in somebody's yard. And I thought, oh, I'd rather like the look of this. This, this is rather interesting. And I, I'd, I'd not been in the club very long, but I'd, I'd made some inquiries and found out, found out where it was. It took me, took me quite a while to track it down. Uh, but tracked it down I did, and it was in, a, in a, uh, somebody's yard, or a barn as it was then, down in Dorset. So I'd asked him what he'd done to it, and did he intend on keeping it on the road, because I'm, I'm rather interested in it. He said, well... It's been sat here 10, 12 years, and he said, I haven't really done anything with it, and I haven't really got time. So I said, would you sell it? Eventually, we agreed on a price of a £1,000. And this was without even seeing it. This was just a photograph um, in, a, in, a, in the club magazine. It was a black and white photograph, so it wasn't colour. He actually brought, brought it out from, uh, from Dorset for me on a trailer, up to my father's bungalow um, in um, July, August of, of 2000. And he turns up outside the door, and I was standing, standing there with, with, with my father. And he looked at me, and he said, Gordon, he said, what have you brought? <laughs> it, was a, it was a mess. I mean, all, all I could see on the trailer, and the trailer wasn't covered at all. It was just this dilapidated old dirty blue body sitting on a, on a chassis with a set of JPS magma wheels. Uh, and that's all you could see. Um, the rest of the car, I, I say the rest of it, odds and sods, were in boxes in, in the back of his Range Rover. It was, it was a, a, a mammoth task, isn't it, of understating things. We lifted the body up. That then hung upside down in my dad's garage from the rafters for about three or four years. Stripped the chassis down to bare metal. That alone took two weeks just to paint it. Once I got that done, I'd left it for about three or four weeks to harden. All the suspension, uh, wishbones, hubs, absolutely everything was, was red rusty. The trailing arms, all the wishbones had to be replaced. There were no brakes with it, no calipers, no discs, no nothing. The original rack, I believe, looking at it, was a Vauxhall Viva rack turned upside down. Quite how they managed to fit it and get it to work. Well, I say get it to work, it didn't really work. Um, the original bracket tree was an absolute mess. Funny enough, I had the original Maxi 1500cc engine with it, although that was, again, a complete mess. Everything was rusty. It was a lot, a lot of work. And then after six years, it was, it was almost ready to drive a rolling chassis. And around about 2006, the body shell, we hoisted it down off the, off the roof. A couple of fiberglass experts, they showed me you could actually rub your hand down the inside of the fiberglass and it was so badly delaminated, it was falling apart. So the search for the moulds went on then. That took me, phew, crikey, eight, nine months to try and find those. And eventually I tracked them down to a guy who lived in Cardiff who had them in his lockup. How they got there, God only knows. Getting the guy to agree to lend me the, the moulds was, was a no-go. He would not do it. He had some strange idea that if he lent me the moulds, I'd take two or three body shells from the mould and there'll be more of them. And I said, oh, I wouldn't do that. I said, A, I couldn't afford to, and B, I haven't got time to do it. So I said to him, what about you finding somebody where you are to take a shell from the moulds. And we finally agreed that he would do that. And that's what this is now. And that was produced around about 2006, 2007. So that shell is now not very old. My fiberglass skills are a little bit uh, minimal. I, mean, I, can, I can do repairs, I can make a few little bits and pieces, but fitting a shell and making doors, bearing in mind the shell didn't have any doors in it. There were no doors cut whatsoever. No apertures, nothing. I'd gone up to one of the kit car shows at, De at Detlin and spoke to um, Raw Striker, Raw Engineering down in Hereford. And talking to the owner, then uh, Mel Cockrock, he'd agreed to fit the shell for me. 
and it was down there two years and four months. I actually bought it back, I think, on the 8th of December 2008. Got it back, and then the real work began. It needed an interior, lights fitting, the seats needed to be covered. It, it had nothing inside, so everything had to be drawn out on bits of paper, mock-ups made in cardboard and, and plaster, uh, plaster of Paris, and then rubbed down and made, made to, to fit, you know, trial fitted to the car. Yes, that works. Okay, we'll make a mould, make it out of fiberglass. Uh, and, and that's how things went on. The, things like the centre console, the dashboard, all the interior panelling, everything had to be trial made, trial fitted uh, in, in mock-up form, whether it be wood, alley, plaster, whatever I could lay my hands on to do it. I think February, March 2009, it got painted. Once I got it back from painting, I, I let it settle for two or three weeks and then started fitting everything up that I'd, I'd previously made and eventually got it on the road in May 2009. I got it on the road on the Friday. Saturday, I did half a mile up the road and back just to make sure everything worked. And on the Sunday, I took it up to the Shuttleworth collection for our club's 50th anniversary of Gilburn and the 40, 40th anniversary of the club and presented it to the public. What's it like to drive? Interesting, I think, is one way of putting it when I was uh, chatting to, uh, to James Elliott about it when, when we did the article for, for the magazine, he was saying it's terribly exciting and very, very quick. Well, yes, it is. You have to concentrate 100% on what you're doing all of the time. You're not really afforded an awful lot of time to look into mirrors. You have to look where you're going all of the time. Steering and suspension are, are very, very good. It, it holds the road like a limpet. You throw it around corners and it will not budge from where you put it. It's absolutely brilliant. It's, it's a racing car on the road, the way it's been designed and built. It's a credit to Trevor Fury for his, for his design and uh, Gilburn's engineering in, in building the chassis. I think they've done a fantastic job. But the original engine that they, they wanted was an all-alloy six-cylinder overhead camshaft engine that was being produced for the Australian market and actually went into a car in Australia called the Tasman. Now, I, I actually had somebody in Australia volunteer to crate one up and send it back to England for me by which time I'd already built the 1500 engine up and put it in the car. So I thought, well, I don't really want to take it out and put the six cylinder in it because um, Gilburn had it not actually done that. So I'd, I'd built it back up uh, as it was, albeit the carbs that were on there were the, uh, with the twin issues. It was okay, but never really ran very well. So I changed it for a, a side draft Weber. I put a 45 DCOE on it with an Alden um, electronic distributor and it ran a sweet and a half of that. I actually run the engine for nearly 700 miles. Did a few shows with it until 2012. I was out on a test run one evening and the Polish lorry pulled out, pushed me into the barrier. Um, it actually pushed the drive shafts inwards towards each other like that. And it snapped the back of the diff off the gearbox. Luckily enough, the body shell wasn't damaged hardly at all apart from tire marks it just left me stranded in, in, in the outside lane of the motorway with no drive. So we got it home, um, I left it, put it in the garage and left it there. I couldn't, I couldn't bear to look at it for quite a while. Gearbox had been destroyed, um, the back of the diff had come, come away from, from the casing, it split down both sides. So I thought, well, okay, we'll try and find another casing. And being the early cable change box, couldn't find one for love of money. In fact, the only person who had one was a guy who ran the uh, Maxi Owners Club Spares Division. He had one in a gold seal uh, in a box. It was a gold seal gearbox and he wanted it for his own car so I couldn't ask him to sell that. Uh, in fact he said no I won't sell it so <laughs> that was that and eventually we um, settled on the idea of rather than leaving it off the road and just leaving it there I thought well I've got to do something with this so that's why I opted for the, uh, for the Toyota running gear. The current setup is Toyota MR2, the Mark II engine with 3SGE with the um, Yamaha derived cylinder head, Mega Squirt ECU, Suzuki Hayabusa throttle bodies running with its 5 speed gearbox. It's got a custom made exhaust system, custom made inlet manifold, and airbox which I made. Produces a shade under 200 brake horsepower. Acceleration is, is, is quite rapid. I've no idea what the 0 to 60 time is, but it, it certainly won't be slow. Suspension is uh, unequal length wishbones, AVO core spring dampers, a quick steering rack, 
at the back. It actually uses front maxi hubs with a, a plate mounted top and bottom where the ball joints would have sat with location rods, wishbones top and bottom, and again, core spring dampers by, uh, by AVO. Everything is rose jointed, absolutely everything, apart from two of the inner bushes, which you couldn't get into to fit a rose joint, which are poly bushed. It was just one of those things, and I thought, well, you know, this is, this is a piece of motor in history. what I would call one of this country's finest designers, Trevor Fury, um, who did the, or later found out, did the um, Di Tommaso Magusta, Monteverdi 450 High for the Swiss businessman, um, the Elva GT 160, uh, the Renault Alpine A310. If you, if you look at a side view of those cars, you can see the design in this. It's so evident who did it. The, the, the back end is, from, from the doors backwards, you, you, you can so see a, a, mang a Mangusta in it. The design is there. You, you can see whose pen drew it. Uh, in fact, I've got a series of photographs of Trevor Fuhr and his, and his uh, psychic, uh, Jimmy English, actually making the one-fifth scale clay model. It, 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 it means a great deal. I mean, I, I, I love driving the car. I really don't know what I, 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 would, I would do without it now. I've probably put 100,000 hours into it. Easily, I was working from 2000 and, um, yeah, 2000, I'd actually had a year off, or a year, nearly 14 months off work with, a, with, with an illness. And I'd, it was, it was therapy, I suppose, in a way, because I was, I was working on the car every single day, Christmas day, Boxing day, New Year's day, New Year's Eve, every conceivable hour I, I had um, to, to, to get it going. And uh, I, I used to think to myself, what am I doing? Am I ever going to get this done? I mean, lucky enough, I've got a, a very understanding wife who was doing shift work, a, shift work in, a, in a nursing home, so, you know, her, her hours were all over the place. And we sort of passed like ships in the night for quite a while. It was, it was quite funny. But um, no, she, she was fully supportive of what I was doing. She knew I wouldn't stop. And uh, you can see the end result after, after all that time. But uh, a real, real labour of love, it really was. But it's something I thought had to be done. Um, I just couldn't let it sit there.